Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. So, if I had a defense bias in the Rudolph case, I'm pretty sure I have a prosecution bias in the Scott Peterson case out of Broward County. I'll have more on that in just a little bit. Many years ago on a TV show called Dragnet, Jack Webb described the job of the police officer as a glamorous, thankless job that has to be done. And I think he pretty much nailed it with that description. It is glamorous. It is thankless. Enforcing the law is never fun. And for the most part, the only time you really get to feel good is when you are able to prevent a tragedy or you save someone's life, that sort of thing. It's a, usually only then that you actually get the accolades for doing the job. And <clears throat> so while I have a natural tendency to have a great deal of sympathy for police officers, particularly in the, in the framework of a self-defense shooting where somebody pulls a gun and the police officers have to fire, I don't have that same level of compassion when a police officer has the opportunity to save lives and instead basically does not do the job. The job of a police officer is to put themselves between the good people and the bad people, to keep the bad people away. It is a glamorous job and a lot of times people aren't thanked for doing it. But at the moment that it counts the most, the police officer has to step up and challenge the person doing the evil deeds. We've had a lot of police officers killed this year, and many of them have been killed by people who were just functionally insane. Others have been killed by people who were just unredeemably evil. When a police officer fails to act, to stop bad people. That is dereliction of duty. And that's really what Scott Peterson is being charged with in Broward County. And so today we're going to take a look at a couple of the witnesses and some of their testimony in this case, more or less to give you a feel for what the state is trying to do here, and also to characterize the difference between these two prosecutions. Travis, which is was just done in a heartbeat and, and it was very unprofessional, and this investigation, which has been exceptionally professional. So with that in mind, let's take a listen to the first witness in this case, who is a young lady who was going to high school at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and was there on the day when there was this attack by Nicholas Cruz. Um, that day, as she always does, um, it was, everything was going normal. We were all just sitting in our seats, listening to her lecture. And then uh, about 20 minutes before um, the bell rang was when we heard the first shot. And immediately we dropped to the ground and started running to, I guess what you would call safety, just basically away from the door where people, the individual wouldn't be able to see us who was shooting. Um, so we heard the first shot, immediately ran over to the corner of the room, and there was about 30 of us in the classroom, so we were all kind of at an L, in the corner that's not by the not by the door and we just sat there and huddled and held each other just in hopes that what we thought wasn't happening or what we thought was happening wasn't happening can i back you up to that first yes. shot that you heard when you first heard that first noise did you know that it was a gunshot instantly how did you know that? 
the sound was just unmistakable. It was the loudest, ear-piercing, horrific thing I've, I've ever heard in my life. Why did students take the approach that they did in response to that shot? Why did you position yourselves in the classroom in those particular positions? A lot of it was instinctual. Um, so originally when the first shot went off, we actually ran towards the window of the classroom and Ms. Reoven instructed us to run away from the window so that we were out of sight. And so once we went into what we would call the hard corner, basically away from uh, view, um, we all just grabbed a spot as quickly as we could and just sat and ducked and held together as closely as we could. Was that procedure, that process of moving away from the windows, something that you had all practiced in the event of an emergency? No, it wasn't. Um, I think instinctually you hear a noise like that and you run away from it. And Ms. Rayoven just something came over her and told her to make sure that we were all away from the window and away from view. And so she was the one that instructed us to go towards the other side of the classroom, the south side of the classroom, away from view of so the window. The teacher kind of took over what was happening in the classroom yes. as far as directing you? Yes. Okay. And did you all follow the teacher's instructions as to which area to go to? Yes. Did she direct you to certain places you said away from the window, what about the door? Um, so the reason she instructed us not to go towards the window is because in the door of the classroom, there is a small window that you can look through and see the inside. So since we were running towards the window on the opposite side of where the door is, um, we would have been in plain sight. So she instructed us to come basically towards the door, but away from the view of the window inside the door so that we weren't in plain sight and that we were in a spot, basically the only spot in the classroom that was a good hiding place. As you all are hiding, do you hear additional shots? Yes. Approximately how many gunshots do you then hear in addition to that first shot? I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it sounded like a lot. And it's okay if you don't know the exact uh, Yeah, number. I don't. Do you know an approximate number? I don't. Okay. As you're sitting there and you're hearing the gunshots, what happens inside your classroom? So we were hearing the first of the many gunshots that were to come. Um, and we were just sitting there basically just waiting. And after a however long it was, um, I want to say it was about a minute and a half, then he um, shot into classroom 1213, the classroom that I was in. Um, he injured four people in my class, um, killing one of them, and then he moved on and continued, and we just sat there and waited. If you can imagine what it was like for those folks. To be in that room, locked in that room, trapped at the mercy of a gunman. The only thing they had to pray for was rescue. And they knew that in order to take down a bad man with a gun, they needed a good man with a gun. And the good man with a gun was nowhere to be found. As, we, as you go forward in that young lady's testimony, she plays a recording from that day. And I would advise any of you who have trouble sleeping for any reason not to listen to that to that testimony and that tape. Because it what you hear is the kind of thing that you hear in a hospital when people are dying among other things and you hear the gunshots and all of that. It's it's actually traumatic to listen to. And if you try and put yourself in the place of those students, it, it would not be a, a set of mental gymnastics you could probably recover from. It, it truly was a horrific environment on that school, on that day in that school. And I think that's what, what, the, what the state is trying to get in, starting with this witness, is you had vulnerable people, 
They were counting on the one guy there who legally possessed a gun, the sheriff's officer, the school resource officer, the guy who was supposed to do more than break up fights and send around drug dogs. This is the guy that's supposed to protect them from the outside world and from the evil influences of the outside world. And instead, he just never showed up. Now, the testimony from the young lady was very emotional in terms of what she was able to record and display and show the jury and to talk about her own personal experience. As a result, the last thing in the world you want to do if you are the defense counsel is to further aggravate the situation by engaging in some kind of uh, strong cross-examination. So instead, let's watch how this very savvy and very good defense attorney handles this particular issue of treating this young witness. Good afternoon, Ms. Hello. I'm very sorry that you endured what you did. Thank you. I'm going to be extremely brief, I promise you. Just a few questions. Your classroom, just so they're crystal clear, is on the first floor of the 1200 building, correct? Yes. And the shooter was on your floor when we're hearing at least the initial shots, right? They were very loud. He was on your floor. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, correct. And there's no question that he was inside the 1200 building, and you were also inside the 1200 building when you heard those shots, correct? Yes. And I think you testified that the sounds slowly decreased, and you couldn't hear them as he moved throughout the 1200 building, correct? Uh, in the classroom that I was in, in 1213, once he went up a couple of floors, okay. like to the second or third, then it died down, yes. Right. And there were times then that he would be shooting that you couldn't hear him based upon where you were located, correct? Yes. Okay. And you have no first-hand knowledge at all about what he was going through and what he was encountering where he was located, correct? Uh, that day, I, had, I was not sure. What the defense is doing there is they're essentially laying the framework to challenge the idea that this police officer knew what to do and knew where to go because... This witness heard gunshots diminishing in volume as they moved away. <clears throat> the whole echoing problem with the gunshots is something that they're trying very hard to portray here and show, for example, that maybe, it's a, maybe there's a good reason why the officer did not rush in. We'll have to see how that plays out throughout the balance of the trial. But next, we're going to go to a Coral Springs uh, sergeant in the canine unit who is testifying because he was there in a non-law enforcement capacity that day. He was out working on the baseball field and you'll hear him talk about what it is that they are supposed to do when they hear gunfire. That's okay. Afternoon, sergeant Heinrich. Um, please introduce yourself to Jerry. Tell them where you currently work. Uh, I'm currently a canine supervisor, uh, canine sergeant at Coral Springs Police Department. How long have you been with the Coral Springs Police Department? A little over 27 years. You've said the word stimulus mm. and stimuli a couple times now. Um, can you explain to the jury when you use that word specifically what you mean? Well, for us, act for us, and, and especially in an active active shooter situation, things change on based on your stimul stimulus. Um, if you have gunshots that are actually actively going off, we're trained to go towards the sound of gunfire. So uh, in our training, if the gun is going off and the shot is being thing, people are dying. And that's the way you have to think about it as, as, you're, as a police officer. If that gun's going off, someone's dying, especially on a school campus um, because active shooters are so prevalent nowadays. Um, so that resorts back to your training. So that's really what I mean by the active stimulus. Did you see Scott Peterson on the day of this incident? No. Did you see him enter any buildings? No. Did you see him render any aid to Aaron Feist? No. Any of the students? No. Did he assist you in clearing any buildings? No. Did you see him assist any law enforcement officer in doing anything? I had no contact with him the entire day. Now that testimony has the capacity to be kind of damaging to the defendant, and so 
I think it was really good for the state to get that information in front of the jury. The police officers almost testifying like an expert. They certainly could have objected, although I suspect he would have been allowed to testify as a fact witness with expertise because during the course of this situation, he was outside treating the wounded. He was pre applying life-saving measures to some of the kids who were injured. But now, this, this occurs the second day, and this is the cross-examination of the sergeant uh, by the defense attorney. Good morning, Sergeant. Good morning, sir. This is not the first time we've met. We met once before. Yes. And that was for a deposition, correct? Yes, sir. And you had said yesterday that in preparation for your testimony, you actually read through that deposition, correct? Yes. And that was back on June 30th of 2022. Is that correct? I'm going to have to st I'm, I'll stipulate to you, yes. I, okay. I, it sounds correct, yes. For the point, the defense counsel asked him about what a deposition is, and he explains to the jurors what a deposition is. And then they get into the things in the deposition that help his client. And these are done through uh, leading questions, which are perfectly appropriate during cross-examination. Watch how quickly this goes, and then we'll have a little commentary afterward. If I heard you correctly, you are you're a sergeant, supervisor in the K-9 unit, correct? Currently, yes. And that is Coral Springs Police Department, correct? Yes, not, not for sure. No, not, not for sure. Just so they're clear, Coral Springs Police Department is different than Broward Sheriff's Office, correct? Yes, sir. Broward Sheriff's Office, my client works for, you work for a completely different agency. Yes, sir. And while some of the areas that you patrol overlap, you are completely separate agencies, correct? That is correct. And I think we said it earlier, you've been with them for 27 years, yes, correct? And you knew my client from interactions that you had with him, correct? Yes. Uh, about four to five years, your son went to school there from 2015 to 2019, isn't that correct? Yes. And you knew him to be a good person, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would call him a friend of mine. Okay. And you never saw him be a coward in any respect, correct? No. Okay. And just so we're crystal clear, during the entire shooting, you never saw my client at all, correct? That's correct. Let's explain why, because you were in completely different areas, yes, right? Sir. So you never would have seen what my client was doing, correct? That's correct. How he was acting? I never had any act interaction with him the entire day. A couple of days like this in a trial are all about setting the scene. And the first witness who provided the audio and, and a little bit of personalization, and then this witness who sort of talked about you're supposed to run to the gunfire, and then said, yeah, you know, the guy was my friend. I never saw him be a coward. But then again, I only saw him sporadically, and he would never have had the opportunity to see him be a coward. And cowardice is not something that is displayed generally. It's displayed in discrete instances. For example, when someone is shooting off an AR rifle inside of a school. So while it did do some good for the defense to go down this road, Ultimately, it's going to be a panel of jurors that decide whether or not this man is a criminal or not for not doing what he was supposed to do. Again, I have a, I have a very pro-prosecution bias in this particular case because I feel like the police officer here, the sheriff's officer here, had a duty to go in there and stop the active shooter, very much the way the Louisville police did in the Louisville shooting and very much unlike the Uvalde police, who, I don't know what they were thinking, but they allowed a lot of carnage to go on too. So this is not the first time that this situation has arisen, but now that we've had two examples of it, I think the state of Florida is trying to make a point here. No longer, not on my watch. If you carry a gun and you have a badge and your job is to serve and protect, then you better go serve and protect. Well, that's what I have for you from day one and part of day two of the Scott Peterson trial. I will try to get to more of this testimony in this case uh, later on this week. But for right now, thank you so much for watching. Have a marvelous day. Be kind to others. 
and know that God loves you. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.